Honourable members, honourable senators, the Speaker of the House of Representatives and the President of the Senate. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite senators and members to take their seats. On behalf of the House, I welcome the President of the Senate and honourable senators to this meeting of the House of Representatives and the Senate in this chamber to hear the address by His Excellency Hu Jintao, President of the People's Republic of China. Honourable members, honourable senators, the President of the People's Republic of China. I invite members to resume their seats. <coughs> Mr. President, I welcome you to the House of Representatives Chamber. Your address today to members and senators is indeed a significant occasion in the history of our federal parliament. Yeah. I acknowledge the honoured Chinese guests among us and extend a welcome to Mr Wang Gang, Director of the General Office of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China and other senior officials who are in the gallery. Yeah. On behalf of the parliament, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, Mr Senate President, on behalf of the government and I know on behalf of all members, I extend uh, to His Excellency Hu Jintao, the President of the People's Republic of China, a very warm welcome to our national parliament. And I extend uh, that welcome 
uh, to uh, his wife, Madame Liu, and to all the other members of the Chinese party. It would be no exaggeration, Mr Speaker, to say that ten years ago an event such as this would have been seen as not only like, unlikely but indeed highly improbable. Equally, I would not have thought ten years ago that as Prime Minister of Australia I would have as I did in 2002 as the leader of a Western centre-right political party to address the cadres of the Central School of the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing. I think that says a number of things, um, Mr Speaker. It says something of the way in which our world has changed. It says something of the common sense character of the relationship between Australia and China. Because that event in 2002 and this event today both occur without either of our two nations in any way ab abandoning their distinctive but different traditions. I would characterise the relationship between Australia and China as being both mature and practical and also a relationship that is intensely built on growing people-to-people -people links. We are different societies. We have different cultures, we have different traditions, and we have different histories. And no purpose is served in pretending otherwise. But that has never blinded, might I say, successive Australian governments of both political persuasions from an endeavour to draw from the relationship those things that can be of great and enduring mutual benefit to our societies. So in those senses it is a very mature and practical relationship. The people-to-people -people links are immensely important. If I can describe it this way, the most widely spoken foreign language in Australia today is a dialect of Chinese. Three per cent of the Australian population, no fewer than 550,000, claim Chinese ancestry. Speaking personally, 13.3 per cent of my own electorate of Benelong in Sydney claims Chinese ancestry. There are 34,000 students. There are 34,000 students from China studying in Australia. Mr Speaker, China is now Australia's third largest trading partner. Last year, the signing of the natural gas contract for the supply over 25 years of natural gas to the Guangdong province was a veritable landmark in the evolution of the economic relationship between our two nations. Two-way trade between Australia and China has trebled since 1996. Let me take the opportunity today, Mr Speaker, of recording on behalf of the government our appreciation for the constructive and practical and wholly positive approach that China has taken in helping in partnership with others to resolve the challenging issue of North Korea's nuclear capabilities. No nation has more influence on North Korea than China. And the resolution of that issue, which must necessarily involve other nations as well, is very important to the stability and the peace of our region. Finally, Mr Speaker, it is self-evident that the relationship between Australia, the United States and China, respectively 
on a two-way basis our relationship with the United States and then again our relationship with China will be extremely important to the stability of our region. Our aim is to see calm and constructive dialogue between the United States and China on those issues which might potentially cause tension between them. And it will be Australia's aim as a nation which has different but nonetheless close relationships with both of those nations to promote that constructive and calm dialogue. Mr President, you and your wife are greatly welcomed to our country. We thank you for coming. We wish you well. We know that you will receive a warm reception from many people in this country who will demonstrate their affection for the important relations between our two peoples. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr President, I've already had the opportunity to welcome you and Madam Liu to this country. I now have great honour to welcome you to our parliament. Your historic uh, presence in this parliament so soon after your inauguration as the President of the People's Republic of China testifies to the importance and the continuity of the relationship between our two great peoples. This occasion is indeed a celebration of that continuity. On the uh, visit to Australia four years ago by your predecessor, President Jiang Zemin, he paid tribute to the pioneers of the relationship between our two countries. President Jiang said then, there's an old Chinese saying that when you go to the well to draw water, remember who dug the well. So it is with great pride, Mr President, that I note the distinguished presence in our gallery today of one of those well diggers, former Prime Minister of Australia, Gough Whitlam. Yeah. Australians, of course, remember his efforts then, his groundbreaking trip to Beijing as leader of the opposition in July of 1971 the establishment of full diplomatic relations with the People's Republic in December 1972, and the first visit to China by an Australian Prime Minister 30 years ago this month. So it is in this context that we do look forward to the further development of the new Trade Framework Agreement signed today. And we're also delighted with the $25 billion liquid natural gas deal signed last year and the prospect of more cooperation on energy security between Australia and China. These achievements, Mr President, are further examples of 30 years of hard work developing relations between our two countries, begun by Prime Minister Whitlam and sustained by his successors. Continuing that legacy, of course, is a priority for Australia, and it certainly is for me. On this historic occasion, we also remember the indispensable condition on which we established this relationship, our commitment to one China. My father, interestingly, was another one of those well diggers. As Gough Whitlam's treasurer, he accompanied the Prime Minister on that trip in 1973. He had the opportunity to meet uh, Premier Zhou Enlai, the man who brought about the historic detente in China's foreign policy with the West. My father described President Zhou as a man of natural dignity and obvious strength of character, a man of reason and cultivation. Mr President, they are the qualities of leadership and that we must emulate them as we work together to make our region economically stronger, free from the threat of terrorism and committed to the principles of international law and human rights. Together, we do face some critical issues, critical areas particularly on the matters of security. Among them is the threat of North Korea's nuclear weapons program. 
we see a crucial role for China in progressing initiatives to ensure that North Korea turns away from this destructive path. On behalf of the Parliament and the Australian people, let me also congratulate you, Mr President, for the recent success in manned spaceflight. The world has marvelled at China's recent economic development, but this stunning achievement shows your nation's technological advance as well. It symbolises a sense of purpose driving China and its leadership today, the greatness of your people and their contribution to world civilization. As China seeks to fulfil its destiny as a leader in regional and international cooperation, no country is better placed to assist it and encourage it than Australia. This is something on which there is bipartisan agreement. And that's why my first overseas visit as opposition leader was to your country. And I'm delighted that our relationship is gaining new strength and I want to turn it to our mutual advantage. Mr President, we are old friends, but there are unlimited opportunities for new partnerships. And it's in the spirit of goodwill, the purpose of peace and friendship and the determination to be partners in the development of our region that I join the Prime Minister in the warmest of welcomes to this Parliament of the People of Australia. Mr President, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to address the assembled members and senators. The Honourable Andrew, Neil Andrew, Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honourable Paul Calvert, President of the Senate, the Honourable Prime Minister John Howard, distinguished members of the Federal Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to have this opportunity of coming to the Parliament House of Australia, meet with you and address such a distinguished audience. Let me begin by expressing on behalf of the Chinese government and people my best wishes to you and through you to the courageous and hardworking Australian people. Though located in different hemispheres and separated by high seas, the people of China and Australia enjoy a friendly exchange that dates back centuries. The Chinese people have all along cherished amiable feelings about the Australian people. Back in 1420s, the expeditionary fleet of China's Ming Dynasty reached Australian shores. For centuries, the Chinese sailed across vast seas and settled down in what was called the Southern Land or today's Australia. They brought Chinese culture here and lived harmoniously with the local people, contributing their proud share to Australia's economy, society and its thriving pluralistic culture. More than three decades have passed since China and Australia established diplomatic relations. Our bilateral ties have stood the tests of time and international vicissitudes and made steady headway. To consolidate and develop its all-round cooperation with Australia is a key component of China's external relations. We have always viewed our friendly ties with Australia 
from a strategic and long-term perspective. To cultivate deeper and all-round cooperation between the two countries is the common aspiration of the two governments and peoples. This afternoon, I will have an in-depth exchange of views with Prime Minister Howard on bilateral ties and regional and international issues of mutual interest. We will also sign a series of bilateral documents on cooperation. This shows that China-Australia cooperation in various fields is going deeper and broader. I am convinced that China and Australia will shape a relationship of all-round cooperation that features a high degree of mutual trust, long-term friendship and mutual benefit, a relationship that makes our two peoples both winners. How should countries go about their relations with one another in this complicated and diverse world? It is a question that is very much on the minds of many people. We are of the view that for a smooth conduct of state-to-state -state relations and for lasting peace and common prosperity, countries should act in compliance with the following principles. First, politically, they should respect each other, seek common ground while putting aside differences, and endeavor to expand areas of agreement. Our world is a diverse place, like a rainbow of many colors. Civilizations, social systems, development models, different as they may be, should respect one another, should learn from each other's strong points amid competition and comparison, and achieve common development by seeking common ground while shelving differences. By mutual respect politically, we mean that the political system and path of political development chosen by the people of each country should be respected. Democracy is the common pursuit of mankind, and all countries must earnestly protect the, de the democratic rights of its people, uh, of their people. In the past 20 years and more since China embarked on the road of reform and opening up, we have moved steadfastly to promote political restructuring and vigorously build democratic politics under socialism. While upholding and improving our systems of people's congresses, multi-party cooperation and political consultation under the leadership of the Communist Party, and regional ethnic autonomy, we have advanced the process of scientific and democratic decision-making and promoted grassroots democracy, protection of citizens' rights and freedoms, and democratic elections, democratic decision-making, democratic management and supervision by our people in a country's political, economic, cultural and social life according to law. We have stepped up the building of the legal system in China, making sure that there are laws to go by, that the laws must be observed and strictly enforced, and that violators must be prosecuted. As a result, the enthusiasm, initiative, and creativeness of the Chinese people of all ethnic groups have been galvanized, providing an immense driving force for the country's development. In future, we will continue to move forward our political restructuring in a vigorous and cautious manner as our national conditions merit, improve our democratic institutions and legal system, and build a socialist political civilization. True, China and Australia are different in social systems. This is the result of different choices made by our people in light of their national conditions and the two countries' different historical evolution. As China-Australia relations prove, so long as they understand and treat each other as equals and respect their respective national conditions and circumstances, countries with different social systems may very well become partners of friendly cooperation with constantly increased common ground. Second, economically, they should complement and benefit one another, deepen their cooperation and achieve common development. With economic globalization developing in such depth, 
No country can expect to achieve economic development goals without going for effective economic and technological cooperation with other countries and actively participating in international division of labor. Bringing in capital, knowledge, technology, and managerial expertise needed for development at home and in return providing products and know-how with comparative advantages for the development of others. This is how countries achieve common development through mutually beneficial cooperation. Right now, China has entered into a new stage of building a world of societies and in an all-round way and accelerating the socialist modernization drive. We are engaged in developing a socialist market economy and opening the country still wider in more areas with a higher level of sophistication. While speeding up strategic economic restructuring, we are vigorously implementing the strategies of revitalizing China through science and education, of sustainable development, of the development of the West, and of renewal of the old industrial base of northeast China. China enjoys a vast market, abundant labor, social and political stability, and a vibrant momentum for development. A stronger and more developed China will bring growth opportunities and tangible benefits to other countries in the world. China and Australia are highly complementary economically. Blessed with a vast territory and rich resources, Australia boasts economic and technolo technological successes. The potential for China-Australia economic cooperation is immense. Past, present or future, we see Australia as our important economic partner. China-Australia trade grew rapidly in recent years from US dollar 87 million in the early years of our diplomatic relations to 10.4 billion US dollars in 2002. China has become Australia's third largest trading partner and fourth largest export market, and in fact the fastest the growing one. Australia is China's ninth largest trading partner and the biggest supplier of wool. Over the years, China has purchased large amounts of iron ore and aluminum oxide from Australia, which has such energy and mineral riches. Last year, the two countries signed a 25-year, 25 billion Australian dollar deal on LNG project in Guangdong, thus laying a solid foundation for our bilateral energy cooperation. Also expanding steadily are the bilateral exchanges and cooperation in science and technology, agriculture and animal husbandry. By June 2003, Australia has invested in a total of 5,600 projects in China with an actual investment exceeding 3.1 billion US dollars. China has invested in 218 projects in Australia with a contractual value of 450 million US dollars. We are ready to be your long-term and stable cooperation partner, dedicated to closer cooperation based on equality and mutual benefit. The trade and economic framework between China and Australia, which will be signed today, will mark the beginning of a brand new stage of our trade and economic cooperation. I am convinced that this framework will help steer our bilateral cooperation in economy, trade and other fields to continuous new highs. Third, culturally, we should, they should step up exchanges and enhance understanding and mutual emulation. Diversity in the world is a basic characteristic of human society and also the key condition for a lively and dynamic world as we see today. The proud history, culture and the traditions that make each country different are all parts of human civilization. Every nation, every culture must have their strong points 
and advantages, and all should respect one another, draw upon each other's strengths, and strive to achieve common progress. China has a 5,000-year civilization. Its people of 56 ethnic groups have worked together to shape the magnificent Chinese culture. The Chinese culture belongs not only to the Chinese, but also to the whole world. It has flourished not only through mutual emulation and assimilation among its various ethnic groups, but also through interactions and mutual learning with the other countries' cultures. With reform opening up and modernization drive pressing ahead in full swing, we are all the more eager to draw upon the useful achievements of all civilizations. We stand ready to step up cultural exchanges with the rest of the world in a joint promotion of cultural prosperity. Cultural pluralism is a distinct feature of the Australian society, a feature that embodies ethnic harmony in this country. Just as the national anthem goes, Australian people have come across the seas. Cultural exchanges have long served as important bridges for enhanced understanding and deepened friendship between our two peoples. Last year was the 30th anniversary of diplomatic ties between China and Australia, while Celebrate Australia 2002 delighted Shanghai citizens, Chinese performing artists had their debut in the famous Sydney Opera House. In recent years, people-to-people -people exchanges between our two countries have grown rapidly, with annual visits well over 100,000. China is the biggest source country of foreign students in Australia now. We should continue to expand our cultural exchanges, giving fuller play to culture's role as the bridge and bond in the building of friendship between the two countries and the peoples. Fourth, in security, they should strengthen mutual trust, cooperate on an equal footing and endeavor to maintain peace. Peace and development remain the dominant themes of our times. Uncertainties affecting world peace and development have been on the rise. Traditional and non-traditional threats to security are mixed together, rendering some regions unstable and turbulent. Terrorism attacks from time to time, cross-boundary crimes have become more pronounced. How to meet these challenges, secure peace and development in the world, and create a stable and harmonious homeland for all is a critical question that calls for serious consideration and effective solution. China advocates a new security concept featuring mutual trust, mutual benefit, equality and cooperation, and strives to resolve disputes peacefully through dialogue and cooperation. We believe in democracy in international relations. The affairs of the world should be handled through consultation on an equal footing by all countries. Members of the international community should reaffirm their commitment to multilateralism and give full scope to the important role of the United Nations and its Security Council in maintaining world peace and security. China and Australia respect each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity and stick to non-interference in each other's internal affairs and enjoy a growing mutual trust in the security field. The recent years saw increasing exchanges between the two militaries, as evidenced by the annual defense strategic dialogue for six consecutive years and the frequent port calls by naval ships of both countries. China and Australia have shared interests in keeping the South Pacific and Asia Pacific stable, easing regional tensions and promoting peaceful settlement of, of hotspot issues. We are both against the terrorism and hope for stronger counterterrorism cooperation. We are both key participants in the ARF and other regional security mechanisms. China welcomes and supports a constructive Australian role in regional and international affairs. We, on our part, will stick to our independent foreign policy of peace, acting forever 
as a strong defender of world peace and a persistent proponent of common development, we are ready to join Australia and other countries in cultivating a secure and reliable international environment of lasting stability. Ladies and gentlemen, Taiwan is an inalienable part of Chinese territory. The complete reunification of China at an early date is the common aspiration and firm resolve of the entire Chinese people. A peaceful solution to the Taiwan question serves the interests of all the Chinese people, including our compatriots on Taiwan. It also serves the common interests of all countries in the region, including Australia. The greatest threat to peace in the Taiwan Straits is the splittest activities by Taiwan independence forces. We are firmly opposed to Taiwan independence. The Chinese government and the people look to Australia for a constructive role in China's peaceful reunification. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been frequent exchanges between our two legislatures in recent years. The Honourable Speaker, Mr. Andrew, and many lawmakers here have visited my country and saw China's changes and progress firsthand. Here I would like to extend this invitation to all of you. We look forward to receiving more of you in China. Looking back and gratifying to see a fruitful past of our relations, looking forward, I feel confident in where the relationship is headed. Let us join hands in writing a more luminous new chapter of China-Australia relationship of all-round cooperation. Thank you. Senators and members, may I, on your behalf, thank the President for his address and wish he and Madame Liu a very successful and enjoyable stay in Australia.
I thank senators and members for their attendance. The House stands adjourned until Monday, the 3rd of November 2003 at 12:30 p.m. and I hereby declare this meeting of the House of Representatives and the Senate concluded. <laughs>